Hey everyone, welcome to our video on data analysis. This is a small part of the course. We don't expect to see much of this in the exam, but I always expect to see some. So we're gonna be on top of it. Okay, we're gonna look at pretty basic stuff, mean and median. So we have to know what these are. I don't think you're gonna get asked to define these two terms, but you, you need to know what they are, right? I know you've done it in maths, but this reminder, always helpful. So the mean is the sum of a group of numbers divided by the count of the numbers. That's, it's our normal way of thinking about an average, right? But the median is a little bit different. It's the middle score in a set of data that has been arranged in order of magnitude, right? So if we are looking at median house prices for sales in a year, it's a common thing that gets reported on in the media. The median house price is the one in the middle from the lowest house price to the highest house price, median is the one in the middle. And that means that half of the houses are sold for more than that and half the houses are sold for less than that. So it gives us a decent meaning of what a typical uh, house price is. Okay, why would we use median when the mean is what we usually mean by average? There are cases where we do use that. So, uh, we use it often when we're measuring what a typical income is. So if we want to know what an average sort of person, what their income will be, then we generally want to use the median. Mean would be fine if the incomes were distributed in a normal fashion. So um, in statistics, standard distribution or normal distribution is shaped like this where the bulk of the figures are in the middle. And so we have our median and our mean are the same number. So if everyone was on a standard distribution, that's that's what our, our incomes would look like. But in Australia, in every country in the world, I should say, um, incomes are not distributed in a normal fashion. There are outliers. So in Australia, for example, we've got this lady, Gina Reinhardt. She's an outlier in terms of income. So she's got such a high income that her and other people like her drag the average incomes up, right? So the mean income is $98,000 a year. The median, so 50% or higher than this, 83,000. So your average is 98, 2000. 98,217, but your typical income is more here, right? 83,000. That's what you would more expect to, to find someone with that income, right? Um, so income distribution is skewed. The outliers drag the median, drag the mean up because they're, they're earning millions and millions and millions. So it, it skews the average, skews the mean. So here, median is a better measure, right? So we are gonna see some skews in data. So what happens here? We've got positively skewed data in this direction. So the mean, this is like incomes, the mean is much higher than the median. Um, so if the mean is greater than the median, there are highly positive outliers. So like Gina Reinhardt with her millions and millions of dollars a year in income. So very large numbers distort the mean and they raise it compared to the median. So here, mean income, 98,217, median, 83,200. Right, so we have to know what, these, what this means when we see data like this. So if the mean is so much greater than the median, that means there are positive, highly positive outliers, right? So a way of interpreting this, what, what you might say, only half of people earn more than 83,200. The higher mean is due to super high incomes and doesn't reflect the typical experience, right? So I'm gonna use some quotes like this just to, to show how this could be used in sort of everyday life, right? Okay, here we've got age, um, average, average life expectancy. Now, we say average, we mean median. So 
we've got negatively skewed data here. I'll, I'll show you this data in, in the same way that it looks like this later on. Uh, very small numbers distort the mean and lower it compared to the median. So life expectancy is skewed by people who die look when they are really young. That's not a particularly useful thing to, to talk about when uh, the mean wouldn't be a very useful thing to talk about when talking about average life expectancy because we want to know what the typical life expectancy is. So if the median is 85 years of age for women, what that means is that more than half of women will live to more than 85, half will be less. That's more useful than saying this average, which um, they don't actually report on the on the mean life expectancy, but let's say it might be somewhere down here, like 75, 78, perhaps. That's not as useful because when you're talking about people and how old they're going to live, they didn't die when they were really young, so they don't have a chance of dying when they're really young. So it's not it's not a useful way of talking about life expectancy. So in Broad terms, what this means, if the mean is less than the median, then that means there are highly negative outliers. So here we can see those highly negative outliers, all those people who die in infancy. All right, to, to use a quote again, half of women live to be 85 or older, shown by the median. The average or the mean is less important due to the outliers, those outliers being those who die very young. Now, this is the way that I found the data. So I sort of had to flip it here and you can see um, as the number of women goes up, here's the, the age that they reach. So it does have that negative skew. That's what it looks like. I'm not sure if we'll, we'll see data like this. I don't think it will be presented that way, but we don't know. It may be. Okay, uh, we also see quantiles. So. A quantile is a sample that's been divided into equal sized adjacent subgroups. And uh, the most common area we'll see this is using uh, splitting a population into income groups. So we saw this with the Lorenz curve and income inequality. So see the average income of 20% of earners um, is the average income of that, that second lowest 20% the middle 20%, the second highest 20%, and the highest 20%. So sometimes we split things up into portions like that. Now, uh, interpreting linear regression. So I'm not sure how we're gonna see this, but it, it could come up. So there are a few things that we really need to, to be sure of here. So the R value, we might uh, come to see this. It's a measure of correlation between two variables. So if there's a value of zero, no correlation. They, these variables have nothing to do with each other. Um, well, they, they don't move in the, they're not correlated. I shouldn't say they've got nothing to do with each other. Uh, between zero and one is a positive correlation. So as one increases, the other increases. Between negative zero and negative one and zero is a negative correlation. So as one increases, the other decreases. So we can, we can see this um, in, in these charts here that could, could help you out. So ways we might see this as hours of revision go up, so do grades. That's a positive relationship or a positive correlation, right? We might, uh, we, we might get asked about the relationship between two variables in an exam. I have seen that. Uh, you might need to say if it's a positive relationship or a negative. Uh, as hours of sleep increase, illness decreases. That shows a negative relationship or negative correlation. All right, so that's just another example of that. Okay, definitions of correlation causation. We need to know what these are. Uh, the extent to which two variables move or fluctuate together, both positively or negatively. Uh, causation is the extent to which a change in one variable causes a change in another. So they're quite different. So I'll give you a couple of examples. We definitely need to know that correlation does not equal causation. There's a guy who runs a website and what he finds are weird correlations. So he's, he sifts through data. I'm not actually sure how he does it, but he looks at hot dogs consumed by, this is when he found hot dogs consumed by Nathan's hot dog eating competition champion. Uh, that correlates with the total number of automotive recalls. So when 
Um, a car gets recalled because it's not safe, right? They've clearly got nothing to do with each other, but when he's plotted the data against each other, they've, they've, they've correlated. So, but there is no causation here. So correlation does not cause, um, does not equal causation. And just for fun, I'll put another one in. Kerosene used in El Salvador correlates with Google searches for attacked by a squirrel. Um, so clearly nothing to do with each other. There's no causation there, but there is a correlation. Uh, further interpreting a linear regression, the R squared value, that shows to the extent to which the change in one variable is explained by changes in the other variable. So you might have to interpret a number here. So the numbers are always between zero and one because it, it's uh, squared, so there's no negative numbers now. Uh, the variables with the higher R squared coefficient are more closely related. There's, there's a higher causation there. It does not show complete causation. Um, there's usually multiple variables that are going to, to cause a variable, another variable to change, right? Um, it's not usually just done by one thing. So uh, we've got a chart here. An R squared of 0 0.861 means that 86.1% of the change in unemployment is explained by the change in GDP growth, right? That that sort of make that does make sense. Um, that there is a causation there. If people buy less stuff, we need less people to make it. So this is really the extent of what we could reasonably expect to see in the exam. There's nothing too tricky in there. We'll just do a little bit of practice in class. Okay, thank you.